Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, we had a few technical issues for those people online. So, um, back on track. Yeah. So, we were just going over the acknowledgements. Um, so, a big thanks to Roy Edwards and his team. Sage and thanks to Sue, who was our chair in Sage, who helped um, put things together. You know, you really gave us a, a big push before we were part of this group. Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, Dion Payne and Cherie uh, Jane Waitoa, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and the staff and students of SOSI 314 who um, started developing. Uh, reports towards the management plan and the strategic plan for um, the arboretum that we used quite a bit in developing ours. And of course, many other students and staff who have been contributing towards uh, planting and managing and cleaning the arboretum. Uh, a lot, we owe uh, many thanks to a lot of students, but um, We'll, we'll show you the work that our students have been doing in the Arboretum uh, and which classes are involved, but we won't go into naming all of them because there's many of them. So a bit of history um, about the Arboretum. So the Arboretum was established around 1986 as part of the Diploma in Parks and Garden Technology, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> and with a significant contribution from Roy Edwards. The area was established to meet a number of teaching activities including the display of specific groups of plants for amenity horticulture, and also to allow students to gain hands-on experience with practices such as pruning. Over time, the land area was increased, as well as the number of habitats, plant species, hybrids, and cultivars, which enabled the area to be used for a wider variety of teaching and research activities. In 2002, the horticulture department was disestablished, and since that time, there has been less management of the Arboretum. However, recently there has been renewed interest and calls to not only protect the resource, but to discuss what opportunity the future holds. So a little bit about us, the AGG group. So the AGG group stands for Arboretum uh, Guardian Governance Group. It was established in 2021 to provide leadership and governance of the Arboretum area on campus through ensuring its continued use as a living laboratory for staff, students, and external partners of LinkedIn University. The group includes staff, students, and community representatives. So as I said, Sue is today, um, since she's retired, she left the stage and joined us, and she's our community representative. Uh, Katie is our student rep, and the rest of us, you can see where we come from. So. We're a group of uh, people from uh, multiple backgrounds, which makes our team effort, uh, you know, it, it really helps us reach uh, some really uh, exciting results whenever we can. So the big why, you know, um, the algorithm is very valuable and uh, it supports education, research, ecology, heritage and culture. Uh, these specifically include a very large collection of magnolia trees, which we'll go over um, in a little bit. Uh, other significant exotic plants, a diverse collection of native plants, a reflective and recreational open area, a rich history and heritage of the place, and a range of adjacent activities, uh, including groves of chestnuts, hazelnuts, um, coppice, and viticulture and other productive areas. As a group, our vision we had to come up with a vision to make sure that we uh, that not only we're, we're taking care of the arboretum today, but that we have a long term vision for whoever is going to continue on with taking care of the arboretum that they align with the common vision. Um, so what is our uh, beautiful um, arboretum will look like? Um, so as a Lincoln University living lab, uh, because we are part of uh, the living laboratory as, as a group, the Arboretum will be a thriving and dynamic resource for education, research, recreation, bringing Lincoln's unique ecology, heritage, culture, and community together. It's a lot of things, but it has the potential. So uh, we ended up developing some clear goals and objectives. Um, so that we can come up with a plan and that we can put uh, short term 
plan and a long-term plan and work towards these. So the objectives have been developed to align with the Lincoln University strategy that was set up in 2019 to cover all the way to 2028, including the sustainability, Maori research and education and partnership plan. So um, the objectives, the first one is to create a dynamic teaching and research environment. Uh, so the idea is to turn the arboretum into a living lab for teaching activities, enhance the research capabilities uh, inside the arboretum. Objective two, to celebrate our unique cultural identity. So um, from a cultural perspective, develop and enhance the arboretum to reflect the cultural narrative as provided by Anna Fenua. Provide a space for staff, students, and the public to engage with the Fenua. Provide bilingual signage that reflects biodiversity, flora, fauna, history, sustainability, and so on. Create or connect Marakai and Rongoa species uh, to support teaching and learning in line with Mana Fenua narratives. Celebrate Makariki and other Hingakai calendar events. Um, that support Māori narratives, uh, planting and harvesting. Implement culturally appropriate memorial activities that align with Māori values, for example, refrain, the spreading of ashes, or memorials that celebrate the passing of loved ones and uh, in an area that supports food or life. The third objective is to bring staff, students, and the community together. So use events to bring people together, involve multiple interest groups to broaden the network of the Arboretum. Objective four, to protect heritage values of the Arboretum. So protect our Magnolia collection, protect our native plants, celebrate the history and heritage of Lincoln University and Tano, and protect adjacent chestnut and hazelnut tree. For objective five, we're looking into increasing biodiversity, in particular the native biodiversity section and um, and uh, and how we can also impact the rest of the campus. So increase the variety of the plants that we have in the arboretum and on campus, uh, and also maintaining what we have. Uh, manage invasive plants and pest species, which is a big problem, um, especially rabbits are a big problem in the arboretum to allow beneficial flora and fauna to thrive. So uh, we, we uh, organize activities to remove invasive plants and, uh, and, and of course, trapping for uh, controlling animal pests. Finally, objective six, to encourage passive recreational use of the space. So make the arboretum more visible, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, and make it more, not just more visible, but also accessible to visitors, whether they're on campus or from outside of campus. Uh, and develop the landscape to provide more opportunities for more passive recreation and relaxation for everyone who uh, is interested. I'll uh, pass it on to Jill, who will talk about the Magnolia Collection. Thanks, Nada. Um, just a brief introduction. Um, many of you who have been down to the Arboretum, this is what you're going to see, and I'm sorry about the other. Um, certainly in September, and I've got uh, a few pictures here that have all been taken in the last two weeks of the deciduous magnolia. Um, they're bright in your face, flowery plants. The flowers don't last long, and some people think they're actually quite fragile plants. Well, as you'll see, the arboretum has been, I guess, a wee bit ignored over, over the last few years, and yet most of these trees have survived, although they're, they're putting up epicormic shoots a lot of them, which shows they are indeed a little distressed. We can overcome that, and that's quite an exciting future we look forward to. So really, I'm just going to show you a few lovely little pictures. Um, now, as Nada mentioned, in 1986, the Arboretum was started, and within four years, Roy and a couple of his uh, workmates had planted 50 magnolias. Um, another three years and it had come up to 80 plants. So that was the start of a really, really good collection. And eventually it came up to over 120 species. Now this included evergreen magnolias, mangliateas, um, mycelias, which are actually renamed as magnolias, and quite a few of the uh, very lovely deciduous hybrids 
species in cultivars. Now over time, uh, many, many have flourished. A few have uh, popped by the wayside. Um, I asked a friend of mine recently um, who supplied actually 31 of these trees originally many years ago. Um, I sent up photos and I said, uh, what can we do to revive these plants that are, are failing a bit? And he said, now he, he had imported them from uh, places where they get summer monsoons. He said, Canterbury, um, you know, you, you're pretty dry over summer. You need irrigation around these trees to revive them and you need mulch to actually protect their roots. They will throw out lots and lots of fibrous roots in the way they'll go again. So that was pretty exciting news from Peter. This was Peter Kay. Um, he, yeah, he gave me hope that we can really, yeah, get what's left there really uh, stepping up again. Plus I'd like to introduce some new uh, plants from Van Super, who's a really good top New Zealand uh, uh, magnolia breeder. So really, uh, September is the time for these deciduous um, cultivars and hybrids. They're coming into summer, you'll get the flowering of the uh, evergreen magnolias and they have a quite a nice fragrance, with fragrance to them. My Kelias are also evergreen now flowering at the moment too, now for the wee bit of a fragrance. So basically these pictures speak for themselves. They're stunning uh, plants and um, they are a feature. Uh, staff who know about these, we often see them creep down there at lunch times um, during this time of year, have a good look at them. Close up of some of the, uh, the ones called David Clulo. Um, I was hoping um, Rosalind Kerr was here because this one's called Rosalind. <laughs> no greasy enough or anything. <laughs> some lovely, yeah, lovely plants. Like I say, they're fleeting flowers. And after I've taken these pictures, we get a horrendous frost. And within a couple of days, those flowers are looking brown. They, they start to um, look a bit sad fairly quickly anyway. But hey, they're, worth it. they're worth having and they're worth preserving. Just click on. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just am going to talk about uh, the three nut crops that we have in as part of the arboretum. The hazelnuts and then the chestnuts are very close to the arboretum, whereas the walnut tortured is at the end of the farm road, which is a bit far away from the arboretum area. So all the three nut crops that we have here are uh, nearly 35 to 40 years old. <laughs> and hazelnut collection is in uh, very good shape. There's the nuts that came out of uh, the orchard. Yeah, a great diversity of uh, nut size and then also the taste. And then uh, the best thing is uh, the hazelnut orchard hosts scores of uh, fantails. You have to be there to enjoy them. Yeah, you have to be there when they are jumping around like crazy. Yeah, it's very hard to photograph them, but yeah, to watch them is a real treat to us. Yeah. And then the walnut orchard. We have got uh, a good collection of both the Rex and Merrick varieties of uh, Walnut Trial. This is the Rex Baker Memorial Walnut Trial. And then it used to be in a perfect shape. You know, the, the cuttings from this orchard has been taken all over uh, New Zealand for grafting, and they are being grown in. There are walnut orchards, several walnut orchards across New Zealand anyway. The, when we were working, the, the big problem here is to be the walnut, bl uh, walnut blight caused by the bacterium. We worked on it, and then the soil here harbors several bacteriophages. The bacteriophages are the viruses that eat the bacteria. So it can be still be used as a living lab. 
Does the walnut from that orchard? In the green and beautiful, yep. Coming to the, the this must be a chestnut, I think. Sorry. Yep, yeah, no worry. <laughs> Yeah, this is more clear. The chestnuts, you can see the burrs, the spiny burrs. We, we have four different uh, varieties of chestnuts. They're all uh, Spanish chestnut, the sativas, the American chestnut, the Molissima, Chinese chestnut, and then the Japanese chestnut, Granata, and there are several hybrids. This is the only chestnut orchard in the South Island. Whereas in the North Island, there are several orchards, especially in the Waikato, where the New Zealand Chestnut Council uh, you know, exists. And then uh, well, the, when I arrived in 1997, the New Zealand Chestnut Council is the one which gave me the first job. So I really owe quite a lot to them, yeah, for my yeah. Those are the uh, nuts which have fallen on the ground. And these chestnuts are being uh, utilized now for uh, gluten-free beer. They are making you know, quality, so much of uh, you know, value-added products like you know, the beers, the ales, and then because of a disease problem in the nuts, if they are stored in uh, the cold storage, they, are, they allow the sugars to develop and then immediately freeze them, freeze dry. And then, they are not able to meet the market for uh, freeze dried uh, chestnut puri to stop the turkeys during Christmas. Yeah. That is uh, during, that's, that's the photo I have taken in 1998 when you know, we have uh, chestnut growers from all over New Zealand visiting us. That is, uh, that is Harvey Smith, who used to be the director of the DSIR. Yeah. And then uh, the fungus which I worked with has been named after him. It is called, it is a tongue twister. It is Pneumoniopsis smith -Ogilvii. So Harvey Smith and then David Ogilvy who worked in Australia. So it was the species is named after both of them. We still have that problem, but the thing is we can work around it. And the, another beauty is the chestnut blight caused by Trifonecteria parasitica has wiped out chestnuts across the world, but we managed to avoid it. We don't have chestnut blight in New Zealand. In, uh, it arrived in Australia in 2005, and it's causing great problems, whereas we don't have that fungus, yeah? Thank you. Next. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Bowie from Pest Management and Conservation, and I want to cover the I guess the ecological aspects of the um, arboretum and how we use it for teaching um, in the living lab there. So um, there's a couple of subjects in particular, ECOL 293 and ECOL 103, that we we get um, classes down there and, and use the area for monitoring and um, demonstrating restoration and other other things. These are basically snapshots from videos that we've recorded from the from the class uh, that we had four streams of for the Ecol 103 um, this year. And usually, what what uh, I do is talk about um, uh, the plants that we've already got there and other plants that we might want to plant, and which species these may benefit. Um, and uh, for example, this one here, which is um, the uh, cabbage tree. Uh, moth and the larvae feed on the cabbage tree. That's the damage that you'll see on cabbage tree leaves. And then we um, we get, we get out and do a bit of um, weeding um, because that's an activity that uh, a lot of people don't enjoy doing, and it's one that gets forgotten. And so we get the weeding out of the way before we do the, the fun part of planting. So here's a couple of the areas. Here's a, a raised area on the, on the left. Um, where uh, we, we brought some sort of uh, rocky soil in to, to get those dry species established so they wouldn't get wet feet and die off. And then the wetland on the right hand side, um, where you can see some plantings around also. 
So what we're what we're basically doing is is getting the students to help us plant a, a large diversity of um, of uh, native plants that will cover the whole um, the whole year um, with food, either nectar or berries that will um, feed the birds, attract the birds, and then hopefully eventually um, make them stay and, and breed and so forth. And a couple of, of the birds that we're targeting probably are the, the keraru and the tui. They're two bird species that used to be on the Canterbury Plains, um, but are not there purely because there's no food for them. So by planting in places like uh, the Arboretum, we can provide a stepping stone uh, that will link up to other stepping stones that um, are being made or planted by Tiara Kakariki, Tiara Kakariki Greenway Canterbury, um, that are planting between um, the Waimak and the Rakaia River from the mountains to the sea. So here's here's just a range of species, and you can see um, you can see here how the um, uh, the, the fruiting times or, or the nectar times um, of these various plants um, cover the whole year, and that's what we're looking to do by planting a, a large range of species. This is uh, taken out of the Tui Tucker um, uh, pamphlet that the Banks Monitor Conservation produced. So there may be some other species that we will be putting in there um, for the Kira root. Likewise, with um, invertebrates, um, a lot of the larvae will feed uh, 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 herbivorous, and so they'll feed on plants. And so by, pl pl by providing a large range of plants, um, we can actually get a large range of um, native species. And I've really just chosen the Lepidoptera, which are the, um, uh, the butterflies and moths, just a few species. Obviously, there's uh, lots of species of moths. Um, out there, but not so many of the uh, butterflies. And we can see the yellow admiral up on the top top left. That feeds on um, exotic species of urtica. These are these are the stinging nettles. The red admiral uh, is more specific. It's, it likes some um, tree nettle or the swamp nettle, so native species. Um, and so we want to try and get these species there so that we can get good populations of these occurring. We do see them there, um, but we we want to. Um, build up these populations. Another species, the copper butterfly, you've got on the top right hand side. This is one that we've never seen on campus until recently. So I've been here 40 years, and John, what you've been here 30 odd years. Both sets of eyes haven't seen the copper butterfly on campus, and yet we know it's close by around Lincoln. Uh, but after the last planting, was it last year? Uh, we, I, I observed two uh, coppers landing on and around um, the Mullenbeck here, which is its um, host plant. So if we plant, we, we, we can attract these species back. The same goes for the blue butterfly where we had the Hilgendorf that was um, uh, knocked down and we, we managed to convince the powers that be to let the grass grow there. And what normally happens is that the, the host plants are mown and they're not available um, for the blue butterfly. But when we let that grow, we actually got lots of blue butterflies coming around with our students putting it onto iNaturalist, which is really cool. So we want to kind of allow some grassy areas for those uh, legumes to establish and um, get the blue butterflies down there. The bottom two are, are moths now. Um, the magpie moth um, feeds on Senecio. Now, this is something that we haven't planted, but it's it's actually um, occurring in disturbed areas around the arboretum, which is really cool. And then the one on the right, which doesn't have a common common name, it actually uh, lives on um, Carmichelia or broom. Now, these are this is just one example of many that we could actually put out uh, that we could plant to actually attract uh, these moths and butterflies um, to the area. For example, this this one here, um, the cabbage tree moth, is only well, uh, it's one of ten that live on cabbage on cabbage trees and rely on cabbage trees. Even though one of John's students um, spent um, all uh, the PhD working on on cabbage trees and found close to a hundred species that uh, on on cabbage trees, but ten of those species actually rely on cabbage trees. 
So you can see where I'm going here. If we plant a higher diversity, there's going to be a lot more moths, uh, um, herbivorous species that will be attracted to um, native, native species that will be attracted to those plants. The same goes for lizards. We know that we've got um, the New Zealand skink or one of the species, uh, Ligosoma species on campus. We've got their little footprints on some of our tracking, um, tracking cards and we've disturbed some areas where we've seen them. Um, and so we want to try and get the food sources for them so that we can hopefully have a, a hotspot for them. And we haven't seen the gecko here uh, on campus, but in saying that, um, when areas get developed around um, Christchurch and there are populations of geckos, they quite often get translocated. Examples of the translocations include to Rickerton Bush, for example, and even the Prebleton uh, Park close to us here. So if we can establish a, a good um, or low predator regime around um, the area, we can then um, uh, ask to get some of these translocated. But we need to provide the food source. We've already actually planted um, these species, but we need to make it bigger. Um, these are like three sort of taxa that, that uh, provide berries for the lizards that they feed on. Um, and then if we can provide some safe haven for them, now we can use um, things like these onduline sheets. And they're basically two pieces of um, this onduline and they have um, doweling, which is just a spacer underneath. And when we put them together, it creates a little gap just big enough for the lizards to go in, but not large enough to let the rodents and hedgehogs in. So it's a sort of a safe haven. So when we use these, you can lift up that top layer and see many lizards un underneath that cover if they're around and they've got nowhere else to go. But we can do this. Another way we could, we could actually get rid of those predators is to put in a predator fence, which is something we've been talking about. We would need to raise about $12,000 or thereabouts to, to do this. But wouldn't it be exciting if we could have an area like this where we can have an abundance of these lizards? So these are the, the, the main threats. We, we could also add um, possums to these. Um, and of course, rabbits are the, the ones that are uh, eating and nibbling down some of the plants. So if we, if we had a predator fence, we could actually uh, pretty well keep out most of these. The mice might be the ones that we might struggle with, which uh, everybody else does in predator fence sanctuaries. So just at the moment, what we've got is an area um, that is trapped and we've got these uh, uh, ethically tested traps have gone through the ethics committee to, to use these and our ECOL 293 actually service these traps around the arboretum. And so we, we set them with a bait of uh, a, a hen's egg and some peanut butter and um, this is our way of keeping the, the predator population down at the moment. So another thing, another pest, uh, we might talk about the weeds, and we have got um, lots of weeds around this area, um, but um, these ones here I'm looking at are the, the wetland weeds. The one on the, on the left-hand side is kind of the before, where we had lots of um, yellow iris growing in the, in, the, in the pond, in the wetland area. We had some willow, um, and we had um, Carex pendula, which is a very nasty weed um, that goes down waterways. And so we had the students help us dig out a lot of these, and then we got a digger in to finish off. And you can see the before and after with a few plants chucked in on that, on that photograph. So we, so really as an ecologist, what we're aiming to do is to put in the right plants and attract the wildlife back. Things like um, like uh, fantails and grey warblers um, will come if you create dense plantings with shading and, and leaf litter at the bottom that create those insects that will come up and they will feed on them. But while we've been doing our Eco 103 just in the last couple of weeks, we've actually seen kingfishers um, right beside the pond. Now we came up with a, a possible idea of introducing some frogs in that pond, which would be great food for the for the kingfisher. Uh, we've actually seen a couple of grey warblers and we've seen a family of um, a duck with some ducklings um, 
strolling through the, uh, the dry pond while we were doing the planting. Also, if I can get this to work, A couple of bellbirds, a male and a female, came to greet us when we were there, just in the last week. Be a quail there too, somewhere. Oh, anyway, you get the idea. So it's really cool that we could actually have students there and they could actually see the, the biodiversity around us. Um, so the, 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 one of the final things I want to talk about is the water waterway welfare. This is something that I don't believe Lincoln University has done very well at. We can see lots of um, drains around the campus that they're, they're just a mess. They've got, they're full of silt, they've got rubbish inside them, they've got lots of weeds on them. And so one of the things we did recently with a donation from um, Southern Woods of a whole lot of carracks is to actually plant along one of these waterways. And we had students clearing out the uh, yellow iris and so forth and um, teaching them about riparian planting and how that can help the quality of the water and stabilizing the banks and reducing um, the soils going into it. I just, just one other thing I forgot to mention is that um, with our eco uh, 293, we do a lot of monitoring there. We, we, we do five minute bird counts. We put out these little bird recorders, audio recorders, and we, 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 we're we actually been doing that for a few years now. So we've got a quite a good sort of uh, background information on what birds are there. We've got the predator stuff from our tracking tunnels as well. So um, we know what predators are there. And so hopefully with the trapping and the planting, and um, we will actually see changes over time, which would be really cool. And then my final slide, something that's just happened recently, we've just heard back um, that we've got funding from the teaching, uh, what's it called, the CAPEX, um, that we'll be able to make uh, some signage um, for the area. And these are signs that we've used um, in other places like Quail Island and um, uh, Mahori Reserve. So we'll use something that will talk about how to identify the species, um, the, the importance of the species for ecology and some cultural uses um, by Maori um, of each specific um, uh, plant. So that's something that we need to work on a bit more. We've got some of these already made, but there's some other new species that we haven't got. So it's not just ecology um, classes that we go here. We've got Sylvia here. Um, what class was her? Sylvia class, I'm not sure. Three, okay. Three. Yep. And I've had Marcus's class out there once, haven't we? So, uh, and I've done a whole day there with the Link 101. So it's it's getting a lot of use for teaching, and um, I, I think it's um, a great resource. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Mike. Kia ora koutou. Um, I just want to touch on these a little bit as well in that um, we've had uh, a lot of our design students down there also, um, particularly last two on one. I just want to acknowledge um, some of the work and, and 697 that they've done down there, a lot of weeding and, and planting. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's just a really great resource for our design students um, to actually get hands on with plants down there. That's actually one of the only ways that we actually get that um, with, with our course. So, um, but also now I'm um, just talking a little bit about, um, I guess, what the future arboretum might look like. And actually we had our um, design students um, engage in a, in a project um, a couple of years ago to try and think about what that might be. And the brief was um, to develop a landscape proposal with a series of cohesive design interventions that met the vision of the Arboretum. So thinking about all those objectives and if you think about all the stuff we've heard already about how we bring all of those elements together in a cohesive design, it's, um, it's actually not that simple. <laughs> it's quite complex. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the, the work of all the students um, that have let me use um, in the slides today. So credit to those students. Um, so one of the things that, um, particularly in this course, we look at is 
um, how we design in context. So how we use the, the site's unique characteristics to inform um, a design. And, and alongside that, thinking about what stories might be told um, through design. Um, in this particular project, um, uh, the student was looking at the underlying sort of natural systems um, of the, the Canterbury Braided River systems. And I guess um, not just in the waterways, but also the, the traces left behind by the landscape. Because um, actually, I don't know if you guys know, but if you, if you um, look at Google Earth, um, you can actually see a lot of those um, remnants still there um, in, the, in the topography. So there's, there's that underlying element, but there's also this kind of overlay of pastoral um, field uh, landscape. Um, and that was used in the design um, quite uh, cleverly, I thought, um, to actually um, create little biomes of different plant habitats um, representing those across um, Canterbury. So, um, you know, bringing through the, the biodiversity that Mike was talking about in a in a vegeta vegetative sense. Um, then also um, other projects looking at, um, you know, not just the flora like the Tikorka and the um, wetland species, but also the fauna um, that we might have down there. And I have heard anecdotes of, um, you know, seeing the tuna. Um, any guesses for whether that's the short finned or the long finned um, eel down there? I don't know. Um, but yeah, we have seen those down there in, in prior years and we'd like to get those back. Um, um, also the Pukeko. So the students were definitely thinking about these things when they were designing. Um, also bringing together that really um, important aspect of research and teaching. So what spaces might enable those activities to happen? Um, and here we see um, an outdoor classroom setting and there were many different examples of that um, in the work. Um, and also we had things like greenhouses and um, kind of research um, uh, structures that people could come and engage with what was happening down there. And um, just noting back to that um, point earlier about responding to the site, you might see the shape of a magnolia leaf in the structure there, which I thought was quite um, quite interesting abstraction. Um, bringing through the, the idea of the heritage of the site, you know, trying to protect that. Um, a lot of students actually um, dealt with that in quite a um, sort of a gentle way, I guess, um, letting the magnolias speak for themselves. Once we bring those back to life, um, you know, maybe all it needs is just some seating and, and just a, a bit of space for them to, to appreciate that in a relaxing way. Um, also thinking about, you know, just how to really make this place um, just a great place for everyone. Um, with uh, particularly with passive recreation activities, you know, so I see here in this one um, some structures that maybe you could come and sit down and do some do some work in, um, some seating just to enjoy the space, um, perhaps some perennial pollinating plants to to help with um, you know the food production that's happening down the other end there, and um, potentially even signage, you know, just to help people navigate their way through. Um, and speaking of, of signage, um, actually one of the things that a lot of students realised was that there's no arrival experience going down there. You know, you, you've got no idea um, when you enter um, or where to go once you get there. So that's something that, um, you know, sometimes thought about in terms of a cultural narrative. We did see some students follow that um, angle, which was quite nice. And we are um, trying to consider how um, this, you know, future designs might tie in with the Lincoln University camp, uh, Lincoln University cultural narrative, um, which brings us to um, some other work that we did recently. Um, so we've had a couple of workshops and we've got another one or two planned uh, to really start teasing out, um, you know, what we know about the Arboretum or what students know and what they want to know. So how we can communicate it more effectively through signage and other means. Um, so that's, a, that's another way people can get involved. Um, so if you are wondering how you can get involved, um, we've got our details there. You can contact any of us. Um, 
as you know, you've seen some of the work that we're doing. Uh, we're doing, um, we're always doing planting and weeding sessions down there. Um, there might be other workshops and things like that. Um, anything else to add? Well, usually we we try to engage also the community in these activities. Absolutely. Uh, staff and students. Um, we try to advertise them as much as we can. Uh, but yeah, any help we can get is much appreciated. <laughs> Excellent. So that, I guess, brings us to a close. So thank you. And uh, if there's any questions, now's a good time.